Uh, welcome to the uh, North Carolina Local Government Redistricting Session today. Uh, I am Bob Coates, the Governor Census Liaison, and I'm a staff member uh, here at the North Carolina Office of State Budget and Management. Um, today, um, we are, uh, we're lucky to have staff from OSBM, myself, and State Demographer Dr. Mike Klein uh, to talk with you a little bit about how to get to the new 2020 census data that's going to be available tomorrow. Uh, and also, we're very fortunate to have uh, staff from the North Carolina State Board of Elections, Kelly Turno and Brian Neasley. Um, please excuse me if I mispronounce those names, uh, but they're going to give you uh, really the nuts and bolts of uh, what the, the legal framework of, um, of redistricting is all about in North Carolina. So we hope between a combination of explaining what's going to be released tomorrow, how to get to that data, and how to use that data, you'll be as informed as possible uh, for tomorrow's release uh, and to make the best of the, the limited time we have because of COVID uh, to, um, to get redistricting done for your area. So with that, I am going to uh, go ahead and uh, share my presentation here. Oh, and uh, let's see. All right, let's see if we can get this shared. Apologize for delay. I've got multiple screens going here and I'm trying to get the right one. Bob, that looks good right there. Okay, great, thank you. Uh -huh. Apologize for the delay. Okay, so our goals for today are, uh, as, I, as I mentioned just a little while ago, uh, myself and Dr. Klein are gonna talk to you about uh, what exactly we can expect from the Census Bureau, uh, talk about the formats that you're gonna get that data from and what other products may be out there and, and how you can get to the data. Uh, and the, uh, the Board of Election team will talk to you about the legal requirements uh, for redistricting. Uh, now, a little bit of information as we uh, go into the session. Today, we're really focusing on the 2020 Census redistricting data. Uh, this kind of comes on the foundation of a webinar that we had back in May, uh, where we actually had U.S. Census Bureau staff who talked about uh, the redistricting data that's coming out. They also talked about the new census privacy policy known as the Disclosure Avoidance System or, or Differential Privacy. Um, and also uh, the, uh, the challenge process for the census counts that are coming out uh, known as the Count Question Resolution Program. All three of these things are, are very closely associated. Um, so today we really want to focus on the redistricting part of things. We, we may be able to field a few extra questions, uh, but if you'd like some additional details uh, about differential privacy and the count question resolution program, or if you'd like to hear from the census staff about redistricting, uh, please go to the OSBM uh, website for uh, local government webinars. Um, and you'll see the link at the bottom of this slide. So the recording of that May session is there. Um, also, 
Uh, I'll move on to the next slide so you can see what the website looks like. Um, also, today's uh, uh, event is being recorded as well with supporting materials. It's also going to be added to that same website. Um, so if you're uh, if you're a little late or uh, if uh, tomorrow or the next day you want to go back and, and rehear some of the comments, uh, you'll be able to go to this site and get that information from May and from today once it gets loaded. Um, now, a little bit of, uh, of housekeeping for today. Um, we are uh, you're entered in a, a, a really a listen only mode uh, at the top of your window. You'll see a Q&A feature. That's the tool you should use. It looks like a cartoon bubble. Um, at the top of your screen. That's a tool you should use to submit any questions you have for any of the presenters. Uh, the moderators on the back end will process those. Uh, if it's something that we can ask quickly, you'll get a response directly through Q&A. Um, otherwise, uh, it'll be asked to the presenters and your question will be answered that way. Um, so yeah, you, you can't, uh, you don't have direct access over voice to the speakers, but use Q&A and we'll make sure your questions get answered. So with all that being said, uh, let's move into uh, what's happening uh, this week. So the Census Bureau had a, uh, a webinar or uh, an announcement last week that the census release had actually been moved up. Um, so originally they were planning on releasing the 2020 redistricting data on August 16th. However, it is now going to be released tomorrow, August 12th at one o'clock p.m. Um, so. Uh, this is going to be the first time you will see uh, 2020 census data for anything smaller than the state. The apportionment data was released in April, and that was just total state populations. Uh, but this will be the more detailed population all the way down to the census block level. Uh, but this will be your first chance to see county population counts, municipal population counts, uh, the, the population figures that you've been looking for for your communities. This will be the first release. Now, there has been a little confusion. Obviously, things have been delayed because of COVID. Um, and what's being released tomorrow is going to be a delimited text files on the Census FTP website. Um, now, you folks have also heard that the Census Bureau is committed to releasing the data um, through a, another product by the end of September. That other product is the Census website data.census.gov. Uh, they have a data engine there that will allow you to say, I would like to see all the counties in North Carolina, or I would like to see all the census block groups in my county. Um, so it is a uh, maybe a slightly easier tool to use to get to the data you want, but the data is the exact same data. So even though there are two release dates mentioned, it is the exact same data. They're just released in slightly different formats. The data that's coming out tomorrow, as I mentioned, is delimited text format. This is essentially the same format that was used to release the 2010 census data. So if you were around back then, this will look very, very similar to you. Uh, now, in terms of what's available right now, the Census Bureau has made shape files with the new geographies that were defined for the 2020 census. Um, they also have reference map and PDF format. So if you would like to see what the census, the uh, the block layout is for your county, uh, or if you'd like to see uh, the, uh, the the census geographies for a school district or a census tract, uh, you can find those PDFs now just to have them on your desk. Um, also, the census blocks were redrawn uh, for the 2020 census. So if you'd like to find out what census blocks are in your city or town or in your neighborhood, there are block assignment files that will do that for you. Um, and you can also find uh, the Census Bureau relies on geographic codes to identify states, counties, census tracts, that sort of things. Uh, there are lookup tables to define those codes for you, so you can have those now before the data is released. Uh, and there's also a crosswalk, a block to block relationship file that shows you the crosswalk between 2010 blocks and 2020 blocks if you're trying to do some, some change analysis from 2010 to 2020. So. Uh, now, what's actually going to be released in that delimited file format? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the 2020 census redistricting data uh, is going to cover total population. It's going to cover total population by race, uh, total population by Hispanic and non-Hispanic origin, uh, voting age population, that's 18 and over, 
group quarters population by group quarters type and occupancy status for housing units. That's the only thing that's going to be released on this uh, release tomorrow. Uh, so what I've shown you here are uh, the specific tables. There are six, really six tables that are going to be released. Uh, so you'll see the specific table names. Um, the name in parentheses is how the Census Bureau is going to identify that table. So table P1 tomorrow will be the total race with total population broken down by race. Uh, and the table that you see on the right hand side shows the official race categories that the Census Bureau will use. So white, black or African American, Native American or Alaska Native, Asian, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander or some other race. So those will be reported as those folks who identified as only one race. But then there will also be a matrix that shows all combinations of those races. So uh, as you look at the first bullet, uh, the table name is in parentheses, but that number in the bracket is the number of cells that will be associated for that data. So there are 71 cells of data to identify all the race combinations for the total population. That's going to be provided for every census block in the nation tomorrow. The next table is table P2. That's the Hispanic and non-Hispanic population by race for the total population. And it'll be using those same race categories that we just saw in table one, but they'll be flagged as either Hispanic or non-Hispanic by the race combinations. The next two tables, table P3 and P4, are exactly the same as the first two tables. However, instead of looking at the total population, they're only looking at the 18 and over population. Now, I do want to be clear here. The age breakdown that you see is only total population and only 18 and over. So you're not going to find, if you want to see the preschool age children, zero to five population, that is not in tomorrow's release. You'll have to rate for what they're calling the demographic and housing characteristics file from the 2020 census. That's probably coming sometime next year. So the only age breakdown that you're going to see is total population and 18 and over in tomorrow's release. Uh, next, you'll find the group quarters population by group quarters type. Uh, and this is for the total group quarters population. That's table P5. Uh, and you'll see three cells there. We'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, and then the uh, the one housing table, table H1, uh, deals with occupancy status uh, for housing units. And that actually should be flipped. So there will be three uh, cell items for the housing occupancy information and 10 cells for the group quarter population. I apologize for that error. So. Uh, when we talk about group quarters, a group quarter is a long term housing situation for folks who may live somewhere else. Uh, and that's broken down into two uh, generic groups. There's institutionalized group quarters. Uh, these are things like uh, prisons, juvenile facilities, nursing homes uh, or other institutional facilities or non institutionalized group quarters. Uh, these are things like colleges, universities, military barracks or other non institutionalized facilities. Um, so what's going to be released for these areas is the total population only. There's not going to be any demographic breakdown for the group quarters population. So that's going to be the three cells that you'll see will be the institution, total group quarters, institutionalized, non-institutionalized, and then those categories um, that you see there. Uh, now, as I mentioned at the beginning of my comments, there is a new census privacy policy in place uh, that's called uh, the Disclosure Avoidance System or Differential Privacy. Uh, the only data that differential privacy is not applied to, in other words, uh, that product is there to make sure that you cannot use census data to uniquely identify one household or an individual. The Census Bureau has to maintain the privacy of all data that gets reported to them for 72 years. Um, so the, the disclosure avoidance system or differential privacy is their new way of doing that to counter advances in computing speed and other data resources that put at risk uh, census privacy. So um, the disclosure avoidance system has a privacy loss budget without getting into too much detail that adds noise to census data um, to maintain privacy. There are only three items that do not have census noise added to them. That is the total state population, the data that was released in April for apportionment, uh, the number of housing units at the census block level, 
and the group quarters by type at the census block level. That's the number of housing units and the physical number of group quarters, not the population or the population of the group quarters. All of those population figures will have noise added to them. Uh, and at the block level, the Census Bureau has said that level of noise uh, makes the data at the block level very fuzzy. So when you see this data, you may think, wow, that really doesn't look right to me. Uh, that may be a function of uh, the disclosure avoidance system. However, we also mentioned there is an operation in place to challenge the census counts. Uh, that's the count question resolution program. If you're looking at this group quarters population and you know there's a nursing home, you know there's a college or military barracks in this census block, but you don't see any group quarters population for that census block, that may be grounds for doing a CQR challenge. Uh, and that operation starts in January. So be looking at the data uh, and be thinking about, does the data make sense to you? Uh, and if not, are there grounds for a CQR challenge? And if you have questions about uh, that differential privacy or the CQR uh, challenge process, again, go back to our website and view the, uh, the May video. Okay, so as we mentioned, um, we've just talked about the tables that are gonna be released. The tables are going to be released. All that data is going to be released in a zip file. Uh, and the the, um, the slide at the top here says August 16th. That should be August 12th. So that, that, uh, that timeline was changed. Um, so these will be pipe delimited formats. Uh, so pipe is that uh, it's not comma delimited, but uh, you'll see the pipe above the backslash key on your keyboard. Uh, that's going to be the character that separates the cells in these text files. They're going to be released as a zip file through an FTP site at one o'clock tomorrow, coinciding with the news conference. There will be three segments of data and you'll see the, uh, the individual data tables that are associated with each one of those segments here. There will also be a geographic header file, a geo header file that has all the geographic codes and you must have that geographic header file and you must be able to tie that to the data segments to make sense of the data that's being released. Uh, the redistricting website from the Census Bureau has a number of resources to help you make sense of that. Uh, we've been steering folks to that uh, ever since that site went live back in, uh, in April or May. Um, that site right now currently has a Microsoft Access shell and a video. Um, the shell is set up to, uh, to deal with the format as it's already released. So if, if Microsoft Access is your tool of choice, you can go ahead and download that now. So when you get the data tomorrow, you can just flow it into the existing shell that they have and you're ready to begin your queries and pull your data. If you're more comfortable with using SAS or R, um, there are scripts that are available on the redistricting site now. You can download those. Uh, and then as soon as the data is ready tomorrow, you're ready to go. Uh, there's also some technical documentation on the site to explain how the data is going to be released and how to use it. So here's what the, uh, the U.S. Census Bureau's redistricting site looks like. It's census.gov slash RDO for redistricting office. Uh, and you'll see four main links there. The one you really want to pay attention to is this third link, uh, the redistricting summary files. That's the area that has the uh, access shell. It has the scripts. It has the technical documentation. It has the video on how to use these resources. So that's the place to go to right now to, to get the resources that we've just mentioned. Tomorrow at one o'clock, there's also a link on that site to the FTP site where the data will be. Uh, here's the actual link. Um, so tomorrow at one o'clock, if you go to this link, you will find all the redistricting data uh, and, and that's where uh, you can download it and then begin your process of, of taking a look at what's going on in your community. There is no embargo period for this data in the past in 2010, 2000 and 1990. There's been a slight period where the media and local stakeholders could view the data before it went live uh, due to COVID. That's not the case for this year. Um, so at one o'clock tomorrow on this site, everyone will be able to get to the data. So um, what's coming out aside from just the data tomorrow? Um, the Census Bureau has announced that uh, they will be adding some basic information to the Census Quick Facts tool. Um, this will just show you the total population and the voting age population for states, counties, municipalities, and core-based statistical areas. These are things like the metropolitan statistical areas, 
and micropolitan statistical areas. They're also releasing a data mapper tool. Um, this is sort of an online visualization that shows the new census geographies and allows you to hover over them with your mouse uh, to get a little information. It's not really a redistricting tool, but it is a visualization of the redistricting data. Uh, the Census Bureau has also announced that uh, in the past they have released specific news releases focused on each state and highlighting their redistricting data. That's not going to be the case tomorrow. They are going to release some visualizations based on race, the adult and under 18 population, racial diversi diversity, and housing and population change between the 2010 and 2020 censuses. Um, after that time period, they're going to start releasing some individual posts through their America Count series um, after the national release on a state by state basis. But they haven't really released what the schedule for that's going to be. Um, so you may get an email from uh, from me through one of the listservs or through the Census Bureau announcing that uh, the North Carolina uh, census post is now available. We just don't know when that's going to happen. Um, OK, um, with that in mind, the, uh, the North Carolina General Assembly has also begun their conversations about what their timeline looks like for redistricting. Uh, they had an, an initial meeting last week. Um, they had meetings this week where the, uh, the Joint Committee chair uh, released their criteria. That was open to public comment on uh, the 10th yesterday, uh, and the uh, chair plans to call a vote on their criteria uh, on the 12th, tomorrow afternoon, and I believe they're planning on doing that after the House adjourns. He said about 30 minutes um, after after they adjourn, they will uh, they'll have this vote. Uh, their goal is to complete North Carolina. And again, these these timelines are for the General Assembly. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what you have to do locally. This is just the framework that they're operating under. Uh, so the General Assembly's goal is to complete state redistricting by early November. Uh, the purpose for that is to give the State Board of Elections time to create the ballots and everything that will be needed. Uh, candidate filing begins December 6th, so the General Assembly started from that uh, December 6th deadline and worked backward, and this is the timeline that they came up with. Again, that's the General Assembly's timeline. It doesn't have to be your local timeline, but this is what they're operating under. Um, so that is a really quick whirlwind tour of what's going to be released from the Census Bureau tomorrow um, and how you can get your hands on the tools. Uh, now I'm going to hand it over to uh, my colleague, Dr. Mike Klein here uh, for uh, some background on what the data means to North Carolina in terms of going forward with the data and also to talk about some of the considerations that may be impacting this data. Uh, after Dr. Klein's comments, we'll take a few questions for, uh, for the OSBM staff, and then we'll move into the State Board of Elections staff. Um, so Dr. Klein, the floor is yours. Thanks, Bob. I think Bob did an excellent overview of what you should expect coming out tomorrow in the next few weeks. And I just want to highlight a few things. Uh, Bob touched on uh, one of the issues is the differential privacy, the disclosure avoidance system. Um, because this is a new way of um, keeping the data confidential for, um, for um, making sure ind individual information is not released. So with that, I'll, my slides showing. There. Yes, your slides are up. OK, great. So I don't want to get too deep into the, to the weeds on differential privacy, but uh, you can if you want to get into the more technical information, go back to our webinar that we held back in June uh, that gives you a little bit more detail on the te technical uh, information regarding differential privacy. But the main thing to know is that this is is always been committed to protect respondent privacy, privacy both by law and by their their uh, their uh, institutional culture. They've used various techniques since the 1930s. Uh, they started using uh, started as publishing stop publishing small area data during the 1970s for small populations or small geographic areas. They uh, just left out some tables. Beginning in the 1990s. Uh, the, uh, they were do, started doing data swapping, basically taking parts of characteristics of a household and swapping it with others 
keeping the st statistical information, the aggregate information uh, together, but just swapping some information uh, to keep individual records private. Um, and then beginning into the 19 or the 2020s is this differential privacy system, uh, which is a new system. So we're uh, it, it calls for a different way of looking at census data. The thing to keep in mind is that all statistical techniques to protect privacy impose a trade off between uh, how private the information is and how accurate you can have something that is completely private and not usable or something completely accurate and individual information can be uh, unfortunately released. So. So as Bob mentioned, this adds statistical noise to the data um, uh, to uh, protect the individual information. Total housing units and the number of group quarters populate or group quarters not, uh, by group quarters type are the only things that are held invariant. Uh, this is different than in 2010 where you had total population, eight voting age population, and occupied housing units were also reported as uh, counted. Since, so what you will find with the census blocks, they were uh, a little bit fuzzy. So there may be some things like occupancy status is inconsistent with the population counts. There's, there may be some blocks that will show children that appear to live alone. Um, and then the household sizes can be unusually large or unusually small. However, if you aggregate the blocks, and Sister Duro is highly uh, suggesting that you aggregate blocks to higher level or use higher levels of geography, such as tracks, uh, municipal boundaries, and so forth, those uh, that fuzziness is uh, disappears. And you can you can imagine it showing this picture by Surat. Uh, if you got very close to this picture, all you would see is dots. And as you move back from that picture, you see a clearer picture of that park scene. And that's much like what we're doing with, or the Census Bureau is doing with the, the data released tomorrow. Preliminary uh, analysis by the Census Bureau suggests that if you aggregate blocks to a combined population of 450 to 499 people, or because of the way they've designed it for places or municipalities of at least 200 to 249 people, you have reliable data. Um, or if you're just looking at voting age population, uh, aggregations of 500 to 549 total people. Uh, I would also suggest that you wait until the next data products are out, demographic and housing characteristics to uh, use or to calculate anything like average household size, uh, occupancy, those are and other family characteristics. As Bob mentioned, the, the data will be released tomorrow. Uh, most people on this call are interested in the block level data for redistricting, but there are other levels of geography that will be released tomorrow. So you can look at change for county or population for counties, municipalities, uh, other entities, census tract, block groups, and blocks. Keep, keep in mind that the boundaries are the legal boundaries as of J January 1st, 2020. So if you've had any annexations with your municipality, you need to account for those changes if you're doing redistricting. Uh, and I know there's several municipalities that have had an annexations since that time. Um, you can look up the summary level that you need to uh, access the data that'll be released tomorrow. And at one o'clock today, there's also a webinar by the Census Bureau that will provide more detail on the different geographies available in the census data. And finally, I know uh, there are several people on this call that are mis uh, work for municipalities or counties, and you may be interested in the population estimates that are released by my office. For those of you who are not uh, are not aware we do publish annual population estimates for municipalities and counties these data are used to allocate state funds to local areas and we will be publishing population estimates the july 1st 2020 population estimates will be published on september 15th these will be the first estimates to include april 1st 
2020 census counts as a starting point. And just so you know, the 2020 Census Bureau estimates did not include this 2020 census counts as a starting point. We will also include in population in any areas that have been annexed since July through July 1st, 2021. If you are working for a municipality or a county and you're a point of contact, you will receive an email at the end of August with the preliminary estimates that will include the census count and the estimate. And we ask you to review that. And um, at the, this again, these will include uh, annexations that have occurred since uh, January 2nd, 2020. Most estimates, because it's only a quarter of population change, most estimates will, will be the same or very similar to that April 1st, 2020 count, but annexations can impact final estimates. And if you're not sure if you're point of contact, you can email me to, to check on that. And with that, I'll, we'll open the floor for any questions on mine or, or Bob's uh, presentation. Thanks, Mike. That was great information. There is actually a question that closely ties to that. Um, it's uh, regarding differential privacy. Uh, it seems that the smaller the collection of blocks, the fuzzier the statistics will be due to differential privacy and the disclosure avoidance system. Could you please comment on what small jurisdictions can do in the redistricting process to ensure that their electoral district populations and demographic statistics are as accurate as possible? Uh, again, I'll, you know, as I presented, um, the important thing is to aggregate those uh, blocks into um, ideally areas of 450 to 499. Um, and that could be di difficult for smaller municipalities, but that's the, the recommendation from the Census Bureau. Uh, one of the things I forgot to mention is that the Census Bureau is working with the Population Reference Bureau to develop guidebooks, and those will be out. Uh, getting, these are guidebooks to uh, helping people understand differential privacy and how to use the data. Um, unfortunately, it's not they're not published yet, but I'm told that they'll be out by the September 30th release and could be released e even sooner. And that'll be again published to the P Census Bureau. And, and Mike, this may be, um, it touches a little bit on your estimates and on uh, the annexation issue, uh, but this may be something that we also need to, to uh, forward on to our Board of Election folks to, to deal with this one. Um, do municipalities doing council district redistricting need to account for annexations and de-annexations since January 1st, 2020, and how? That would probably be a Board of Elections question. Um, um, I do. So our estimates, again, by law, our population estimates that will be published in September include any annexations that have occurred through the past fiscal year. And for most of those, they're annexations, but they're annexations of land and not population. So I think in many cases, it's not going to be a, a huge uh, issue. Um, legally, I think that that question would need to go to the Board of Elections. OK, so I'll I'll, uh, I'll make sure that we keep that on the radar for the Board of Election folks when they join us. Um, I do want to point out a little bit of background here. Um, so we're, we're going to see data tomorrow that's released from the 2020 census. The reference day for folks being counted on the 2020 census was April 1st of 2020. Uh, now, there was years worth of preparation for the census that went into that. There is an annual boundary and annexation survey that the U.S. Census Bureau does to track what legal boundaries were in place as of January 1 um, of the reference year. It's that survey that sets the boundaries that are being reported in the 2020 census. So when you're looking at municipal boundaries on the data that's released tomorrow, that's going to be the boundaries that had been reported to the Census Bureau that were legally in place as of April 1. Now, the census blocks and everything like that, that's going to totally cover the state, whether you're inside a municipality or outside of a municipality. Uh, but the, the legal jurisdictional boundaries, those were as reported 
um, to the boundary annexation survey that were legally in place as of April 1st. Uh, another thing I want to point out is, as Mike mentioned, the census data is the foundation of the state estimates going forward. You may have seen some data from the Census Bureau talking about race characteristics and some age characteristics from 2020. Uh, those are Census Bureau estimates based on the 2010 census. Even though they're dated 2020, they are not 2020 census counts. They're estimates based on the 2010 census. I know it's confusing, uh, but but don't let yourself follow, uh, go down the wrong rabbit hole. Yeah, oh. and I'll just want to add to that because there was a question on, uh, I mentioned that the, the July estimates, July 1st, 2020 estimates that I will produce, they are estimates, but they're based on the April 2020 census counts, which mm -hmm. will be released tomorrow. So that what's released tomorrow is the Census Bureau, what was actually counted on April 1st, 2020. Every 10 years, we recalibrate our estimates and start over. And so we will be using those to establish the estimates for July 1st. For most municipalities, since there's only a quarter of change, your, those numbers will be very similar, if not the same. But there, you know, there will be some with differences, either they had annexations or had some growth between April 1st and July 1st, 2020. So right. just keep in mind that April 1st is the count. Um, okay. So we have a, a couple more questions here and then we'll move on to our, uh, our friends from the State Board of Elections. Uh, when will the commuting data be released? Um, the uh, the data that's coming out right now is the 2020 census information um, and the U.S. Census Bureau conducts uh, a number, over 80 different surveys. Some of those are annual, some of them are monthly. The commuting data is not part of the once every 10 year census. It is part of something called the American Community Survey. That survey samples every month and releases data every year. Uh, the Census Bureau announced about a week or two ago that due to COVID, they will not be releasing single year ACS estimates for areas of 65,000 or more for 2020. Um, they weren't able to collect enough data to uh, publish it reliably. So what they are releasing will be some experimental tables. Those will be coming out in October um, for areas of 65,000 or more. For areas below 65,000 or for all areas down to the census block group level and track level, the American Community Survey releases five-year estimates. Those are due to be out in December, but we do not know if the COVID impact means that those are going to be delayed or suspended. We're still waiting to hear from that. The American Community Survey does report the commuting data, educational attainment, poverty, um, all the, uh, the detailed characteristics of the population come through ACS. The actual count of the population is done by the decennial census. So commuting data, hopefully uh, in December, but, but please stay tuned. Um, and Mike, I think you answered the question on, uh, you mentioned the similarity to April 2020 uh, estimates. Is this data released actual or estimated? Um, so as, as Mike mentioned, the data that's coming out from the Census Bureau will be the actual count. Mike's estimates and the estimates from the Census Bureau that come out um, reference a, a July period, a reference date, uh, that's an estimate date. The April 1 date from the Census Bureau is the actual count. Um, and there has been a question about are these the actual counts that are coming out tomorrow? Uh, yes, uh, but there is a count question resolution program. If a local government wants to challenge their census count, uh, you can watch the May video for details of that. Um, any change resulting from the count question resolution will change the actual foundational number from the census, uh, but it will not change what's coming out for redistricting. Uh, the count question resolution program doesn't start until January, um, so the numbers that come out tomorrow will be the redistricting numbers. All right, so Mike, I will let you lead us into the next phase of the presentation. So we're going to turn this over to the State Board of Elections. Uh, Kelly Turno is the Associate General Counsel at the State Board of Elections, focusing on election administration. She previously worked on consumer protection issues at a nonprofit and worked as a nonpartisan staffer at the North Carolina General Assembly for eight years where she most recently served as an attorney on elections, redistricting, and state and local government. 
Kelly is a graduate of the University of North Carolina and, North, and the North Carolina Central University School of Law. Turn this over to Kelly. <clears throat> Great, thank you, Dr. Klein. Um, I am so excited to be here with you all to discuss some of the legal considerations in redistricting. Let me make sure my slides are showing. Let's see here. Okay. There, okay. there. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to focus on the legal authority for redistricting at a very high level. Obviously, as you can imagine, it can be quite complicated. Um, and I'm also going to go over some of the um, traditional redistricting principles and the legal considerations involved in those, as well as the re redistricting process in general and how a recent law in North Carolina to address the census delays affects redistricting and election processes on, um, specifically for local governments. First, um, just as a basic question, what is redistricting? Well, in general, it's the process of redrawing district boundaries every 10 years following the U.S. Census. And the purpose is to ensure that voting power and representation are distributed equally among the population. Um, congressional and state legislative redistricting is performed by the General Assembly and county, municipal, and school board redistricting can be either performed by the General Assembly or by the governing body itself. It can also, however, be prescribed in a court order or consent decree in some cases. Why do we have to redistrict? Well, both the U.S. and the state constitutions require it. For U.S. House, uh, the federal constitution requires that states apportion their district, their districts in each state, and the North Carolina constitution requires the General Assembly to redistrict after every fe federal census um, for North Carolina Senate and North Carolina House. And for, for local governments, the General Assembly has authorized municipalities, counties, and school boards to redistrict in certain circumstances. For municipalities and school boards, those governing bodies can redistrict from time to time and generally only to account for annexed and de-annexed territory or to correct population imbalances as shown by the census. For counties, if the County Board of Commissioners is divided into electoral districts, it can redefine those boundaries to address substantial inequality of population among the districts. And when it does that, the district boundaries must be as nearly equal as practicable and composed of contiguous territory. So one of the first, the, the benchmark legal consideration for redistricting is equal population. And this is the one person, one vote principle. There must be population equality among the districts. But what does that really mean? Well, interestingly, for congressional districts, there is no safe range of population deviation. And the figure that I'm showing here is from the 2010 redistricting or 2011 redistricting plan using 2010 census data. And as you can see here, the population deviation is zero or one among the 13 U.S. congressional districts in North Carolina. And as you can imagine, that is very difficult to do. However, federal case law says there is really no safe range of population deviation, and that's why the um, deviation only ranges from zero to one for U.S. Congress. For state legislative districts, the North Carolina Constitution has been interpreted by the courts to require a plus or minus 5% deviation among those districts. And with respect to uh, population equality, what does substantial inequality mean? 
you might recall from a previous slide that in order for a local government in North Carolina to redistrict, it must determine whether there is substantial inequality among its current districts based on the new census data. So the way that you determine this is you take the population of your jurisdiction as shown by the 2020 census and you divide it by the number of districts that gives you the ideal population for each of your districts. Then you apply those 2020 census numbers to your current districts and calculate the population deviation. Now, for those of you who are not good at math, please know I am not either. And so I created a very simple um, example that that I could actually show you. And um, so hopefully you can follow along with this. It's it's hard for me to grasp, so um, I understand the challenge. I created a town called Election Town, um, created four districts in 2020. The census shows that this uh, that Election Town has a population of 10,000 people voting age population. Um, and so the ideal population among those four districts is obviously 2500 each. And there the current population. Um, I added those figures here and then calculated the percent deviation from the ideal. And as you can see here, it ranges from between six and eight percent. So what does that mean? Well, there are really two ways to use these numbers to determine substantial inequality. The first is called the 10 percent threshold. This is a riskier stand standard because the 10 percent establishes a prima facie violation of one person, one vote, which really means that the burden is now shifted to the jurisdiction to show that there is a rational and legitimate reason that there's inequality in the districts. And the way that you would calculate that is you take the highest um, population change and the lowest population change and you add them together. So here the highest is 8% change, the lowest is 6, that's 14. So obviously it is above the 10% threshold and that says, oh, election town has substantial inequality and needs to redistrict. The other more common and more conservative calculation is the 5% threshold. And this is based on North Carolina specific case law. And so if you've hired a consultant or you're consulting with an attorney who's familiar with this area, they will tell you to go with the 5% threshold. And the way to calculate that is just to say, OK, do and what is the um, population change with the highest population deviation? 8%. OK, that's obviously over 5%. And the lowest, the district with the lowest population deviation here is 6%. So even the lowest population deviation in election town is over that 5% threshold. And so you would say, yes, the substantial inequality has been determined based on the 5% threshold, and I do need to redistrict. What are some other important legal considerations uh, for redistricting? These are really considered the traditional redistricting pr principles. The first is compactness. Obviously, this is just what is the smallest possible area that I can create a district within? That's ideal. Your your districts would I also ideally be they have they generally have to be contiguous so there cannot be a break between the district and um, there can't be land in between um, the the district they have to connect without a break. Another important consideration is preserving communities of interest. This seems like a very broad and nebulous uh, phrase. But it basically means what makes that community unique compared to surrounding communities and what do those people in the community have in common? It can include race, but it also includes factors like a shared language, a shared ancestry, a common history, those kinds of factors. And then um, my colleague Brian Neesby will go into why minimizing split precincts is also um, an important consideration when redistricting. And this comes up less, um, I think, for municipal and local government redistricting and more when you're having to get that zero population deviation for congressional districts, for example. 
And the bad word that we we hear thrown around a lot, gerrymandering. Um, basically, it means um, drawing districts in ways that produce different results that may not be proportionate to the electorate. And so here's an example um, that I think is just very helpful as to how um, the same composition of people in a district can create very different looking districts. So say you have 50 people, 60% are orange, 40% are purple. There are ways to obviously create districts that are proportionate to that same ratio 60-40. And there are ways to create results that are not proportionate. For example, five districts that are predominantly orange or only two districts that are predominantly orange and three that are purple. So is gerrymandering permitted in redistricting? For racial gerrymandering, no. The Equal Protection Clause is violated when race is the predominant consideration in drawing district lines and when the legislature or other governing body subordinates traditional districting principles to race in order to create minority districts without a compelling state interest. So again, those traditional districting principles are compactness, contiguity, communities of interest, if those are subverted in or, um, to race and race becomes that predominant consideration, you may have a racial gerrymandering issue. And sometimes it can be hard to determine whether there is a racial gerrymander or whether there is a political gerrymander. Um, and this can occur when um, race closely correlates with someone's party affiliation. And the courts have said the questions to ask there are, could the same legitimate political objectives be achieved in other ways that are consistent with traditional redistricting principles? And if so, would those alternatives have brought about significantly greater racial balance among those districts? So racial gerrymandering, no. Political gerrymandering is generally okay, at least some degree of political gerrymandering. And this happens when the governing body looks at including, uh, looks at protecting or enhancing the position of any certain political party, interest group, incumbent, or potential candidate. Now, these claims might still be justiciable, meaning you could still sue claiming a, an illegal partisan gerrymander. However, it's just a higher bar to cross. And as Bob and Dr. Klein already talked about, obviously um, the census data is currently um, quite delayed. As you can see by this chart from the National Conference of State Legislatures, in general, we would get the data by April 1st of a census year, and obviously it's mid-August. And then a more usable, um, user-friendly format of the same data is not going to be available until the end of September. So what does this mean um, for the redistricting process? Well, first, let's look at how the normal process works. Um, for congressional and legislative redistricting, the General Assembly has to enact legislation. That legislation goes through the same legislative process as any other bill. It is introduced in one chamber, goes through the committee process, um, goes through the floor debate and is voted on by that full chamber and then goes over to the next chamber to do the same. However, it is not subject to the governor's veto as long as that redistricting bill contains no other matters. For counties, municipalities, and school boards, either the local governing body can redistrict using the statutory process or the General Assembly can enact redistricting legislation in a local act. And this is just with the caveat that if the boundaries, again, were set by a court order or a consent decree, you would need to look in that document, that court order, to see if there's an alternative method for revising districts. So when does, what types of governing bodies need to consider redistricting? Well, if you have at-large elections where everyone in that jurisdiction votes for all the members of that um, governing body, redistricting is not required. 
if you have residency districts where candidates have to live in the district, but all the voters of the jurisdiction vote for that seat, there's no one person, one vote one person, one vote issue there because all the voters in the jurisdiction are voting for the same candidates, even though the candidate has to reside in a certain district. And then for electoral districts, the candidate has to live in the district and only the voters who also live in that district can vote for those candidates. For that electoral districts, that is where redistricting may be required after the 2020 census, depending on whether your census data show that you have substantial inequality in population. So for municipal redistricting, the general process is that after you receive your census data, the um, city councils have to evaluate existing district boundaries, determine that um, substantial inequality, and in general, they could have delayed their election to, 22, to 2022 if the resolution had been adopted prior to the third business day before filing begins. But what if the data was not available, which was the case this year? If the data was not available, the legal authority of a municipality to delay their election on their own is questionable because if you don't have the data, you can't determine population imbalance and whether or not you have substantial inequality in population. So, General Assembly um, at the very end of June passed a law that moves elections for the approximately 35 municipalities that elect by district to 2022. The date of that election for those municipalities depends on whether the election, uh, it depends on the election method, nonpartisan plurality, election runoff, or the non the primary and election methods. Um, and it also depends on whether a federal second primary is needed. If there's no federal second primary, the second primary date in North Carolina is April 26th. There is a federal primary in any federal office in North Carolina. The, those dates are moved to May 17th. And the filing period for municipalities depends on how quickly you can adopt your new redistricting plan. If you can adopt it by November 17th, the filing period is the same as county offices in 2022, which is December 6th through the 17th. If you need more time, you must get them done by December 17th. And if you do so, the filing period is noon on January 3rd, through noon on the 7th, which is really the absolute latest date that, um, that we can um, do filing in order to get everything in order for the 2022 elections. There is an exception for at-large contests um, that are affected by this bill. Um, if, you, if a municipality that has districted and at-large contests want, wanted to hold its at-large contests for example, their mayoral contest in 2021 on the normal schedule, they had to notify the County Board of Elections by July 19th. And only a handful decided to do that. Now, the, this law also provides that the municipality can provide an opportunity for public input prior to the release of the census data, but must do so after the release of the data and must conduct at least one public hearing prior to adopting new, a new redistricting plan. This also means that the current terms are extended for um, municipal seat holders who are currently in office and are in the affected municipalities and that the winner in 2022 will have their term shortened because we're back to the normal municipal election odd numbered year schedule in 2023. For county redistricting, the normal process is that counties have to adopt their redistricting plan by resolution at least 150 days before the election that they want to use the new plan in. So the primary is currently scheduled for March 8th, 2022. Under the general law, this means that every um, county that elects its commissioners by electoral district would have to have that plan adopted by October 9th. Well, obviously we can see that would be a huge problem because if the more user-friendly data is not available until the end of September, you obviously can't get everything done in a week. So, um, 
session law 2021-56 also addresses the county issue with the census delay. I also want to add that there is no statutory process for counties that have residency districts to redistrict, so that must be done by local act of the General Assembly. In addition, the general law does not provide a statutory deadline by which school boards have to adopt their redistricting plan. So this new law um, for 2021 and 2022 gets rid of that 150 day deadline and says if your county has electoral districts, which is about a third of the North Carolina counties, your board of commissioners has to adopt your new districts by November 17th. So it gives you a couple more weeks to adopt that plan. Still not a lot of time, but a little more. And there is no specific requirement in this new law about public hearings or public comments, but of course it's very important to provide the public with an opportunity for input on your redistricting plan. Just a couple other provisions that I want to mention from this new law. Uh, voter registration will be open between the first and second primaries in 2022. This um, is really an administrative issue for boards of elections, and that's because in general, voter registration is not permitted between a first and second primary under state law. However, as if we go back to our um, new municipal schedule, you can see that municipal, some municipal general elections are going to be held on the same date of the second primary. While we can't have some people who would be eligible to vote in the municipal election not be eligible to vote in the second primary, um, that's just an administrative um, challenge hurdle for the Board of Elections that is, is really not possible. So that's why voter registration will be open between those two primaries. Um, so this new law also delays a couple school boards to 2022. For Charlotte Mecklenburg schools, it's delayed to November 2022. Interestingly, for the city of Lexington, this original, this 2021-56 law delayed it to November. However, a new law that was just ratified yesterday actually moves it up a bit and says, no, we're going to have those elections on March 8th on the date of the primary. And then, of course, I'm sure you've heard some of the more controversial issues. Um, one is is the Raleigh City elections and the fact that this bill actually permanently moves the um, election to even numbered years for the city of Raleigh and also changes its election method. Now I am running short on time, so I am not going to go over a couple of the frequently asked questions, but I did just include them in the slide so that um, and this slide this PowerPoint is going to be available to you so you can go back and and read through these um, frequently asked questions and hopefully they will be helpful to you. And then finally, just a couple of resources that will also be available through this PowerPoint um, in case you need more information. And that is all I have. With that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, the Chief Information Officer at the State Board of Elections, Brian Neesby. Hi, can you Hi, share can you my slides or do I need to share again? Let's see. Yes, please share again. All right, there we go. All right, hopefully you all can see my slide. Um, so I want to go over the um, the precincts and uh, exactly what we will um, uh, how these changes get made at the State Board of Elections from a procedural perspective. Um, and so uh, I'm going to be talking about these items here, the how the county BOEs update address ranges to account for jurisdictional changes that can happen as part of redistricting or it can happen is part of annexations, or we often call them municipal incorporations. Um, I'll explain how voters are mapped to what are called address ranges in our system and associated with the jurisdictions that they vote for. And I also will tell you about the audits we do to ensure that voters are assigned to the proper jurisdictions. Um, I won't talk about the last point really, but I do want you to know that our system is it, it relies on address ranges um, and that is an older process, and so we will be moving to a fully geospatial system. And I'm telling you these things mostly uh, to account for uh, the timing of these, of how, why it takes us so long to process these uh, these changes. So, um, 
what you'll see on your slide here are the two types of jurisdictions. We have statewide jurisdictions on the left. Uh, these we've already talked about. Um, these shape files, when I say shape files, those in, most of you probably know what those are, but um, the authority for these come from the General Assembly and they give us the authoritative boundaries through shape files. Um, and those shape files are a set of files that will specify the boundary points of the different uh, the boundaries uh, up to a centimeter. They are, they're very they're very specific and those are delivered and they usually have a dot SHP at the end and it's a set of files. So they deliver those files to us. The one exception is actually the county boundary. There is no official. Well, I shouldn't say that there is no uh, space where the county boundary is officially held from a statewide perspective because it's my understanding and Kelly, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but is that counties that is up to county and county resolutions that there's not a statewide uh, re statewide set of boundaries that we can rely on. So we rely on the NC Ge Geodetic Survey for that, but technically that can sometimes be wrong somewhat up the margin. So that's where we get those shape files. The local jurisdictions we get from you guys often the governing body. Uh, we prefer shape files and we'll tell you I'll tell you why in a sec, but it's pretty much because that allows us to truncate the amount of time that we need to get that data into our system. If you don't aren't able to provide shape files and provide instead other means of providing that data to us, including physical PDFs or maps or whatever it might be, that'll lengthen the time it takes us because that means that we have to have our geospatial experts create those shape files for auditing purposes. So I want to introduce you to a concept called the precinct split that Kelly had referenced earlier. Um, and these, for instance, right now that you see before you are the municipalities of Wake. So these are the Wake County municipalities and those green dots are potential polling places. That's not particularly important, but that is where voters arguably if these were um, at large jurisdictions, for instance, would vote for those municipalities those jurisdictions. Now remember that there's 19 different jurisdiction types, so precinct splits, when we use that term, let's assume that this is a precinct and here's our polling place right here, right? The gray could be, for instance, municipality A and the green and yellow could collectively be municipality B and then there might be a school board that kind of cuts down the middle that separates the green from the yellow. Um, and so, what that means is we have three different precinct splits and that would mean that there would be three different types of voters that would get three different ballot styles. So the yellow ballot would get a different ballot style than the green group here than the gray and these are called we call them precinct splits. And so our geospatial system has to be accurate to the precinct split because the precinct split with I'm um, speaking a little loosely here decides what ballot you receive. And so we encode so when redistricting happens, you'll get a change in those. These are census blocks. These represent census blocks, but you'll get a change. And like I showed there, like the green now has kind of moved into the the um, the gray and that represents a, a district change uh, in that municipality. So we encode. Oh, sorry. This this one just simply shows the actual jurisdiction splits that exist within Wake County right now. And jurisdiction splits and precinct splits are pretty much the same thing. I won't go over the, the technical difference. It has to do with ballot coding. Um, but what we do to encode this is we put those precinct splits into address ranges. That means that you have a address range that is, let's say, on the east side of the street, 1600 to 1698 East Betty Street. Um, and we then will assign to each of these the, the jurisdictions that belong to that address range. Um, and so we have 19 different jurisdiction types that we have to make sure are right when we have a massive redistricting effort. And sometimes an address range, let's say maybe cuts into at 1650 East Betty Street here, we actually have to create another row here and create two rows so that we can distinguish the jurisdictions that are assigned to each address range. So address ranges as a database concept have been around a long time. They're not the right way to do them now, uh, but most states are still using address ranges and we're slowly getting over to geospatial files, which would use shape files and geocode points, but currently we still have address ranges. Um, and so what the counties have to do to update 
we get your shape files or we get the shape files of the general assembly or the the nc geodetic survey gets updated and we will go in and make these changes often the county has to look at physical maps to make these changes now with that said we do audit and we audit using geospatial files so i want to and, and let me back up one second and say that that first space for statewide jurisdiction can take roughly two weeks if it's a very complex redistricting effort, which is something we'll be we having very soon here. So when Bob talked about, you know, even though you don't we you don't need to get us the shape files by by November, we tend to want all redistricting processed and audited by the beginning of candidate filing so that when candidate filing is going on, we have the right districts in case candidates have to be looked up. And then and finally, we have both our candidates and our districts perfect so that we can then start ballot coding, i.e. creating the actual ballots themselves. Um, and so, so that is the timeline. So it would be good if you can get us uh, these by if you for by the early November time frame, the same as the General Assembly, so that we have that time for these for doing redistricting and auditing. This auditing process I'm about to show you is the, the last week of that process. That's where we at the state will audit those address ranges that the counties, county boards of elections actually change. So what we have to do that is we have address points that represent voters. So in our database, voters are represented by addresses, and then we have ways of geocoding that address onto actual points. We actually use um, a combination of features, including open source methodologies for doing that. Um, and that's what you kind of see here. And we map those address range address points to um, pers as precise as we can with uh, to the address, the address to the address point itself. And you can see that roughly speaking over the years, we've at most had uh, we had 5% that were unmapped in 2013, but we're down to about 2% now. Um, we then will present that to the voter and we will then look at the address ranges they put in and our geocoded address ranges plus the shape files so those those red lines represent right now a precinct shape file and we will highlight those where the matching doesn't where the assignment doesn't match so you have some jurisdiction that's wrong the geospatial query that we ran said it should be in precinct a and yet you put in precinct b in your address ranges and we'll highlight that for the county the county then can go through and look at those uh, points you can see they're often at the boundary of a jurisdiction split um and then they can actually move the point to put it in the right location so they will physically move that point adjust it in our database so that we get more accurate accurate geocode points um throughout uh you know year by year and, and week by week and then on a weekly basis and i'll end here we then provide the county with an overlook of of what where there's inconsistencies and we provide them a spreadsheet and then they can go in and kind of look at those inconsistencies and see if they can change it. And so we're constantly auditing our address ranges, but because of that, it takes, like I said, two weeks to do the actual redistricting into the address ranges, and then it takes at least a week to do uh, the auditing work. So we, we like at least three weeks uh, for that for that process. One caveat I'll end here is that sometimes if you're small enough, we can do that a lot faster, but we we want usually we do want to create a little buffer. So all in there for Q and A, um, and I'll turn it over to um, whoever's going to do the Q and A. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Kelly. Those are uh, you know I, I think folks hear redistricting and they're like, okay, we can just draw lines on a map. But I hope you understand that there's a very complicated process and there's an awful lot of detail in the back end. Uh, that really is being compressed into a very tight window here. So I hope that gives you uh, some good perspective on what's going on uh, and what you need to do locally to get ready for the redistricting process. We do have a number of questions, and um, <clears throat> I guess we'll just start at the top and work our way down. Uh, one says, uh, when did you say we will see our new voting districts? Um, so my comments at the beginning were referencing the uh, Census Bureau's uh, redistricting site, the geospatial files, for VTDs, voting districts are there now uh, as they currently exist and for which you will get data tomorrow. Um, however, I do want to kick that back over to Brian to clarify that there's a significant difference between a voting district and a precinct. So Brian, do you want to clarify that? Yes, uh, so um, there is a difference between VTDs in the census 
type when the census says BTD, there says voting tabulation district. Those were our censuses, our, our precincts at a specific point in time. You mm -hmm. might know that, Bob. I think it was January 2020. Yeah. Um, and so that's what they were now. And they're also even at that point, there is some boundary adjustment um, that may be off uh, at that point in time. Uh, we also have you also hear uh, our precincts are constantly changing and there's a statutory process to change those precincts that the county BOE will initiate and those precinct shapefiles are always on our website for the most updated version of that and it has to go all the way to our executive director to approve a precinct split or precinct merger or just an adjustment to one of the boundary lines. Uh, last thing I'll mention is that there is a difference uh, there is VTD that is a, a different VTD that's in our space as well. That you'll hear us say it doesn't align with the census concept of VTD. OK, so there are there are files that are out there from the Census Bureau that you can look at now. They may not be the same as what you'll see from the State Board of Elections, uh, but the data that's coming out tomorrow is going to align with what the Census Bureau is currently providing. Uh, you may need to do some crosswalking with some of the smaller geographies like a block group or a census block to make it match up. So I hope that clarifies. Um, next question. So what about municipalities with majority racial minority districts? Yes. So again, you know, redistricting law can be very complicated. I didn't go into all of the factors, but yes. Um, uh, majority minority districts are important to keep in mind. There is a kind of three prong standard from actually a, a case from North Carolina, the Jingles case that basically lays out the thresholds for when you may need to consider drawing a majority minority district in order to avoid a uh, Voting Rights Act violation, meaning that it has the, that a particular redistricting plan has a um, discriminatory effect on the minority voting population. So again, that's very, that's more in the weeds. It's kind of more specific to um, your particular situation. And so I'm, you know, I can't give legal advice um, broadly, but yes, go check out the the Jingles cases and the um, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, the case law um, under that law. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, when determining ideal population, should we use the quote total population or quote the total population 18 years and older? That's the, the voting age population. I believe voting age population is usually what's used. I think there was a case a while ago to determine whether you use total population versus voting age, but I think voting age and Bob, you may have other thoughts on that. I am not familiar enough with the, the general statute to, to comment on it. I know that the Bureau produces both, I think, because it is up to the discretion of the jurisdictions, um, but I, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure on that. So if we do get a more definitive answer, we will include that with uh, the materials that get posted on the website. Uh, the next question is a comment, actually. I believe that non-contiguous districts can be acceptable for municipalities. Uh, think satellite annexations, for example. Yes, absolutely. And again, this was more of a kind of broad primer for local governments on traditional redistricting principles. Generally, your district needs to be contiguous. Absolutely, if if a, one of your districts in, um, includes some area that has been annexed via satellite annexation, yes, that would not be contiguous, but in general, your districts would be contiguous. Um, municipalities that are or were subject to Rule 5 of the Voting Rights Act, how can they avoid gerrymandering yet still ensure that all races are represented? I mean, that that is really the question there. Um, so Section 5 is no longer in effect, so that means that you do not get preclearance from the U.S. Department of Justice or the, um, the D.C. court. Um, so 
you know, that's just something that you'll have to consider as you're working through your redistricting plan, um, looking at the, redist the redistricting principles, the case law involved in North Carolina redistricting. Um, it's just a complicated question as to how you balance um, your um, consideration of race in redistricting. I wish I could give a more concrete answer, but they're they're really just it's very specific to your situation. And just another curveball to further muddy that issue is the new differential privacy policy is going to be adding some statistical noise at smaller geographic levels. Um, so the numbers that you see, there, there's just going to be some 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 buzziness there at small geography levels. Um, next comment, uh, didn't a Wake County Superior Court overturn North Carolina's congressional and legislative redistricting plans as partisan gerrymanders in 2019? Yes, they did. And again, this goes back to whether um, partisan factors are the predominant factor in your redistricting plan and they subvert those traditional redistricting principles um, or you know how it fits into your redistricting plan as a whole. So the court did not say you can't ever consider any partisan, um, you, you can't have any partisan considerations in your plan. Now, the General Assembly, as a policy matter, decided that they were not going to consider partisan makeup at that point. Um, but some level of partisan consideration, including incumbency protection, for example, it has been found by the courts to be a valid aim of redistricting. Again, this is just a very general kind of overview of some of the legal considerations. Um, and so, you know, every situation is different, but in general, you can consider some partisan factors in redistricting. Thanks, Kelly. And the next one is directly targeted at you as well. Kelly, can you discuss what will happen for the municipalities who have already drafted their proposed maps without the census data, like the town of Cary? Uh, will those municipalities need to recreate those maps? What do you recommend for public transparency uh, in a process like that? So um, in a situation like Carrie, the session law 2021-56 actually explicitly says if a municipality adopted a plan under general statute 168-23.1 um, prior to the enactment of this law, it is no longer in effect. Um, I'm not sure exactly what Cary is doing at that at this point. I know they had considered using other data um, and I think that's, um, you know, I don't want to comment on the legal, um, you know, legal authority that they had to do that. Although I just will, I will say if a plan was adopted under the, the statutory process that is not in effect um, for the 2021-2022 cycle of redistricting. And so those, any, re, any um, ordinances or resolutions adopted under that statute are not in effect at this time. I, and as I far just... as the um, transparency, just of course, you know, like you do for any open meetings, you know, give the public an opportunity to comment, be transparent, post your um, plans online ahead of your meetings, um, allow maybe a public comment portal or some opportunity for the public um, to provide comment. And then, of course, you're required by the session law to have a public hearing once you have um, once you have plans to consider. I just wanted to clarify there was a question on whether it was total population or voting age population and in my understanding it is total population and I've there's several people that have commented on that as well so determining ideal population is ideal population or total population for the ideal um, although there may be some case law that's changing that but that's my understanding is total population thanks mike uh, the next question, we have five wards, four have no racial consideration and have pro rata balance with a lower minority representation than the at-large racial distribution. One district is intentionally gerrymandered to create a majority minority representation. Is this still legal? 
And again, I can't comment on the legality of a specific district, but again, sometimes majority minority districts are required to be created to comply with the Voting Rights Act. So that is as another consideration. Um, and unfortunately, I can't comment on um, the legal, you know, the legality of a specific district. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, regarding county boundary shape files, Counties upload shape files to the NC1, NC1 map quarterly uh, at minimum. Do you require county boundary shape files to be sent to you? If so, where do our GIS people send them? <clears throat> so if you're talking county boundary maps, the NC1 uh, map uses the NC Geodetic Survey, which is the survey I, I, represent, I mentioned that we use as well. So that's fine. If you're talking to other local jurisdictions, uh, we do send, we do have the NC Board of Elections at the county level send those to us, and so they usually reach out to the to the local jurisdiction. But counties is through the NC Geodetic Survey that's on NC One Map. And as Brian mentioned earlier, there are sometimes discrepancies between county lines. Uh, NC Geodetic Survey is the agency that's responsible for resolving those, um, so they would have the authoritative county maps that that go to the Board of Elections. Um, what software is being used throughout this process? Um, I know that the General Assembly is using Maptitude. Uh, there are a couple of other software packages out there. Uh, Kelly or Brian, do you have any recommendations or experience? Uh, for software packages, uh, mm -hmm. the only thing I can, I didn't know if it was to our system particularly. Um, if you're just a newbie at geospatial analysis, I recommend QGIS. It's a free software. Um, that allows you to look at shape files. Um, uh, we use actually, as far as our audits go, we use Open Maps, QGIS, and Postgres. So all those are pretty much open source and, and available. Uh, our address ranges are a proprietary home built software based on .NET Core, but I didn't know if that's what you're referring to. And I, I can say that the QGIS is an open source software. That's been the foundation of a lot of the geospatial preparation operations for the 2020 census, um, like, uh, like the block boundary suggestion process, part of the redistricting process to get us to where we are today. Uh, the Census Bureau has been using QGIS, QGIS foundations. Um, if a whole VTD is used in a district rather than being divided, is that easier for the elections board to update the voter records? If you're referring to a precinct, uh, yes, um, it is. If, if it's slightly different from the precinct, it's not as easy, but if it's analogous to the precinct, if the precinct hasn't shifted since 2020, uh, then yes, it's easier. Great. Um, if I understand Kelly Turno, it is not permissible to have a minority district established and maintained. The alternative appears to eliminate the minority district. No, and again, if it meets the jingles test, the threshold of a majority minority district, um, you do need to, to consider race, certainly, and there are certain cir circumstances where a majority minority district would need to be drawn. Um, but again, that's it's very specific. It's, um, you know, it, I'm just here going over the very broad redistricting principles. Um, but yes, talk to your redistricting consultants, talk to your, um, your governing body's attorneys about specifically whether your jurisdiction requires the drawing of a majority minority district. Um, can you speak more about residency districts? I thought redistricting was required for these districts to ensure equal population per candidate in those districts, even though voters vote at large. So for residency districts, and again, this is where um, a candidate is required to live in a district, um, but all of the voters in that jurisdiction are able to vote, not just those who live in the district. There is not a one person, one vote issue there because again, all of the um, voters in that entire jurisdiction get to vote on it. It's not to say that you shouldn't redistrict or that you can't redistrict. However, for example, with the um, with the county commissioners, you don't have the statutory authority to redistrict after a um, 
the decennial census, the General Assembly would be required to do that. And then it's, it is a little confusing because for municipalities, the filing period is actually moved both for, uh, for municipalities with either electoral districts or residency districts. And certainly they do, municipalities do have the authority if they have residency districts to redistrict. However, there are not necessarily the same one person, one vote issues with residency districts that are, um, that would certainly be there with an electoral district. I hope that makes sense. Fantastic. Um, do you have a sense of how reliable the census data will be in light of COVID impact and the premature end of the census count last year? Um, I think that's always a challenge, and, and Mike, you're on the hook with this one as well. Um, the um, Every census uh, since the very first one in 1790 has been a, a challenge to count everyone residing in our communities. Uh, and as we have gotten, uh, you know, we're a much more mobile population now. Um, so that was going to be a challenge anyway. Um, COVID certainly didn't help that. Uh, this was the first census to use the internet to respond. Uh, we know that there was a sizable number of households in North Carolina that did not have internet at home. So that was going to be a challenge. And COVID uh, delayed uh, or postponed how census workers were able to get out to those homes. So the final self-response rate uh, to the census in North Carolina was about 73-74%. Now that does not mean that the rest of those households were not counted. It means that the census workers had to go door to door, had to reach out to those communities to count people. Um, also, the Census Bureau has had to apply imputation or the use of administrative records to fill in gaps for addresses uh, where they didn't get responses. So the Census Bureau is saying that they accounted for 99.99% of all households, residences uh, in the country and in North Carolina. Uh, so you're right, uh, the, uh, the impact of COVID did delay the overall operation, but the Census Bureau is saying they are confident in their operation and how they reached out to folks. Tomorrow is going to be our first opportunity to take a look at the data. Uh, if we start seeing concerns with that data, there is a challenge process in place. That's the count question resolution program. That's a free challenge to any local government that wants to challenge the count, but it's, li it's limited to a very short list of criteria on which you can make the challenge. Uh, it's not just, I think you guys need to do it again. You've got to make your case and you've got to have local documentation to support your challenge. But I would encourage local governments to take advantage of that. It is a free process if you feel that a challenge is warranted. Uh, if you miss the window on the count question resolution program, the special census operation is an alternative. However, that's a very expensive operation and local governments are expected to pay to have the special census done. It is not free. Um, so take advantage of CQR if you feel that your data is off. Um, if anything, uh, the encouraging message is that uh, COVID impacted the entire nation. Um, so it's not that uh, North Carolina's data would look worse than South Carolina's data or Georgia's data. I think everybody's facing the same challenges with this, although I think it'd be naive to say that COVID didn't impact the process and probably will not impact the data. Mike, you want to add anything? I, uh, no, I, I think I, I think he covered it pretty well. I mean, the Census Bureau has just made every effort to to count everybody. Um, and it's all, as Bob said, it's always a challenge to catch, capture everybody, but there are some different ways that they evaluate the census and uh, a couple of things that they've already done at the national and state level, compares, comparing some other, uh, making some other comparisons, and they feel pretty confident that they're, at least at those two levels, that the, the numbers are within range of what would, would have been expected. They'll be doing some other analyses, including there's some outside groups working on it, including some folks at RTI to uh, to get more in, into the weeds of the, the evaluation of the census. We won't know more details until um, later next year or the following year. Yeah. Um, there are just a few more questions here. We'll get through those and then we'll wrap things up. I do want to point out that uh, we do have a, a, a quick survey that we'll be adding to um, to the uh, the chat area, to the uh, the Q&A site. Uh, please take a moment to follow that link. 
uh, let us know uh, how today's session went. But more importantly, there's also a section of the survey to let us know what other topics you'd like to see discussed. If there's a deeper dive in a different data issue or a different concept that the Office of State Budget and Management can help out with, uh, we want these sessions to be uh, as useful as possible to the most folks as possible. So please let us know what you'd like to cover uh, and watch the, uh, the chat area for that link. Okay, the next question. Which race categories or combinations are actually considered as minority? Again, I think it, it I'm not sure if it, if you're talking about with the data itself or with, um, you know, the drawing of majority minority districts. Um, so I don't know if I can uh, answer that. Um, I will say there the factors if you're if you're asking because you want to know if you need to draw a majority minority district, I would um, encourage you to look at the Thornburg B. Jingles case and the considerations there, and that might help you determine whether or not um, your whatever you're considering applies and um, and whether you need to look more closely at that. So as we stated uh, at, at, in one of my slides, the race categories, you will see 71 possible combinations of race. Uh, and then when you factor in whether that's Hispanic or Latino, there are a lot of potential combinations there. Um, so uh, I, you know, it's a very good question. You're gonna have a lot of data to look at. Um, what lines do we use when we have a discrepancy between the county GIS and the state board of elections precinct lines? For Precincts, you would use our lines. We are the official uh, source of those precincts. We have an FTP site on our website that you can navigate to, and there's two areas under that. One has, uh, it's under the precinct folder where you can have actually um, the census block information. And then we have KML files, which are, you can use Google Earth to mm -hmm. look at them as well. So um, yeah, there's a lot of data there and there's a lot of analysis there as well. Yeah, it's a great site if you haven't been there. I, I go there pretty frequently. So thank you, Brian, for, for, for that. <laughs> um, final question. Does the uh, North Carolina State Board of Elections have or will it have a list of uh, local public hearing dates as mandated under uh, S-722 um, for, uh, for districted municipalities redrawing maps this fall? Um. I can't tell if the question there is as so it is not mandated that the state board publish um, public hearing dates of those redistricting um, public hearings. It is mandated that the municipalities publish um, have have public hearings on their proposed plans. So no, we don't generally keep those because we um, the state board administers the redistricting plans based on the data that in the plans that we're given from either the, the General Assembly or the local government. So um, we don't comment, of course, on the on the proposals at all. So you would need to check with the um, municipality to find out when they're having a public hearing. Thank you very much. Uh, that is the last question that I see in the Q&A area. Uh, it's been a great conversation. I'd like to thank everyone for their time, especially want to thank Dr. Klein uh, here at OSBM, uh, Kelly Turno and Brian Neasley at the State Board of Elections for your expert insight on the process. I hope everyone uh, appreciates how complicated and how many moving parts are working here in a compressed amount of time. Uh, again, the uh, redistricting data from the U.S. Census Bureau will be published. Uh, there's a news conference tomorrow at 1 p.m. Uh, the data will be available at or near that time. It might come out a little bit early. Um, so keep an eye out for the site. Uh, again, grab the, uh, the geospatial resources that are available now. Um, and uh, if you have a uh, watch for the recordings of this session with the associated slides on uh, the OSBM local government webinar site, it'll be there soon. Uh, please take a moment or two to complete the survey to let us know what you'd like to see in the future. Uh, and I think in all those slides, you will see contact information for the speakers. So if you have additional questions, please reach out to us directly. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great afternoon and enjoy your redistricting data tomorrow. Bye. Bye, thank you.